Do you want to get better at drawing? Learn to paint in 30 days. Do you desire an art degree? I've spent the last 25 years hearing things like this, and today we drown in them from the moment we open up YouTube or Instagram. There are so many tips, hints, and five minute videos promising to help you claim what should have always been yours, art supremacy. This is not one of those videos. I would struggle to say with any honesty that I know the one true way to learn how to draw or paint. I feel like some subconscious part of me would break from my skull and consume me whole if I so arrogantly stated something like that, so I will refrain. No, what we are doing in this episode is looking at learning art in general, going over the main conventions and institutions that we as artists utilize, what they are and how they work, and then maybe some beneficial strategies in figuring out what works best for you or for each of us individually, and what we can steal from the others in order to place ourselves in the most optimal position to achieve our artistic goals. Greetings, my name is Zach, and if these kinds of topics seem to be your cup of tea, please consider subscribing. Well, how do we learn art? It's a complicated thing to ask broadly like this for a very simple reason. Not all humans learn the same way. Sure, there are generalities, but that's about it. When I taught in the classroom, my strategy was to teach each topic in three different ways. And if I was lucky, those three different ways would account for 85% of my students. That last 15% was a mix of students who did not catch the content in the original strategic methodologies, or students who were beyond the basics and needed advanced help. So this simply translates to, there is no perfect way to describe how you are going to learn to make art. I think the key is to get an even better understanding of how you learn, and then wrangling your motivation and inspiration like wild horses to get them to work for you. After all, if you want to learn how to make art, it is no one else's responsibility but yours. This is fortunate in that you control you, and it's unfortunate in that you can't blame anyone else. If you truly desire to learn how to make art, to learn how to make your art and bring things to life, you are the only one responsible for that. Even if you go to school and you pay tens of thousands of dollars to art teachers, it is your responsibility to make sure you have those skills by the time you leave. Sure, they should be helping you since you're paying them, but if you want the results, you're the only one that can truly achieve them. All right, let's start looking at different ways we approach learning art. I've broken them down into the following categories, classes, books, videos, and the last one is just loosely practice and time. As we go through these, let me know in the comments what your experiences have been with learning and which category worked best for you. Let's start off with classes. This would include school, online classes, mentorship, basically learning from another individual who is more experienced than you, and likely with another group of people who are learning alongside you. This might be middle or high school, it might be college, it might be you signing up for a local life drawing class. There are many, many different things that this can take the form of. For me, the last few years, this has mostly been online classes, some of which I have downloaded and worked through on my own, which might actually move them out of this classification if I'm being honest but others have been done virtually with others, with other people. These I have enjoyed much more, and when you have to show up for a thing, you know, especially something you paid for, you tend to be more on the ball. You tend to put more into it, and frankly, you tend to care more. This is probably the most common area that we think of when it comes to learning art traditionally. You go to school, you go to classes, and you learn how to make things with a group of people all working on the same thing. Stereotypically, this is like the nude figure in the middle of the room and all the artists who are sitting around them in some manner of array, working from their, their particular perspective with charcoal or ink or whatever it might be. This is not often how it takes place, but it is how it takes place. I had nude drawing classes when I was in college. Not in high school, because that would be a little strange here in the US, but in college for sure. And a lot of the other times, in fact, the vast majority of the time, we as a class were working on our own individual projects. We just happened to be in each other's presence. So what are the methodologies used primarily for classroom-based teaching? Usually classes are handled through direct instruction. The teacher talks about a thing or shows you a thing or demonstrates a thing, and then the students have an opportunity to practice it. In art classes, this usually happens several times, building towards some ultimate skill that will then be implemented in a project. 
Take perspective drawing, for example. The first lesson might be focused heavily on horizon lines and vanishing points, simply how they function and what they are, followed perhaps by some one-point perspective shapes. Then this moves into a full one-point perspective drawing, some drawings to practice the techniques and such, maybe it's a little old western town. Moving forward, this comes to two-point perspective. You introduce the second vanishing point, practice that for a while, before likely moving on to a large-scale city or castle drawing to implement the skills you've learned. If your teacher is a risk taker, maybe they'll move you into three-point perspective, but hey, let's not get crazy. In advanced classes or in college classes, sometimes there is no demonstration, just a list of assignments and projects for the students to work on, followed usually by critiques and discussions and grades. That's right, because classes have grades. Uh, I could probably spend an entire podcast episode talking about how grades in an art class are either good or bad. I have very strong feelings that I'm not going to unpack here, but I'd love to hear what you guys think about grades. You know, what does it mean? What does it communicate to a student, to you as an individual, when you get an A, a B, a C, a D, an F on a painting, on a drawing? What does that tell you and how does that make you feel? It's kind of a strange thing. So what are the benefits then of classes in all of their many disparate forms? Well, the nice part about them in general is that you have fewer decisions to make as an artist. If you are young or just getting started, it is hard to debate that this is probably the best option. When you're in a classroom, the teacher knows with some certainty the things that you're going to need to learn before you move on and become more proficient. Too much freedom can actually be crippling, especially when you're just getting started. A class offers direction, it has a mentor attached to it by nature, and you can be guided through the difficult first steps. A little bit of hand-holding right at the beginning of learning any skill is generally a good thing, and especially with art, it's like this comprehensive ocean of things that you need to know or think you need to know, and so having direction, having somebody walk you through it can be super beneficial. If you're lucky enough to actually have a mentor or significant one-on-one -on -one time with an instructor, the benefits of this subdivision only grow. With specifically tailored help, you can improve all the more quickly. There are a lot of benefits to classes. I'm not going to go over all of them. The big ones here are focused on the fact that you're part of a group that is all working towards the same thing. You can learn from your, from your peers, from your companions, and often you can form friendships with them. That camaraderie helps a lot as you move through your artistic ventures. But also, it's the having of the teacher, the professor, the instructor, and the mentor. They are a massive benefit for you, a massive boon, because they are a human who can look at you and hopefully can ascertain what your particular needs are and your particular strengths, and they can help point you in a better direction. Now, what are the deficits then of classes? Well, the lack of freedom can be a double-edged sword as you are at the whim of the instructor. If you happen to have a teacher who is geared one way or another, this can force you to change. This can force you to do things differently than what you would have naturally. Sometimes this is good, sometimes this is bad. A good artist does not always make a good teacher as well. So there are a lot of art teachers who are just good at making art. We've all run into this, right? We have all run into teachers in our life who are really good mathematicians, but they're not good math teachers. They're really good scientists, but they're not good science teachers. So I had this one drawing instructor when I was getting my undergrad degree, and he had spent maybe 35 years at the university that I was attending. He had a lot of art up around the school in some of the um, open spaces and in some of the common spaces, common buildings, like the, um, ah, what's the word for it? It's like the, the student center, yeah. So he had art all around the campus and in many different buildings, not just the art building. And his artwork was very meticulously realistic, like painstakingly put together where every vein, every wrinkle in someone's skin was perfect. But by the time I got to his class, he was so sick of making art like that, that he just pushed everyone towards making abstract or non-representational art. He had spent so much time making realistic things, he was sick of it. And if you tried to make realistic things in his classroom, he would critique you so hard and he would grade you so hard that just everyone turned away from it or they changed classes, they got out of his class. The only reason I survived that class is he found out I was going in to become a teacher and he took a little bit of a liking to me and so he worked alongside me. There was another uh, uh, instructor at the university that I attended. This was a painting instructor and they were notorious for not allowing students to walk out of their room with paintings that were substandard. 
Now, what this meant was if you produced a painting in that teacher's class that they did not like, they felt like there was a failure, they would take the paintbrush out of the student's hand and they would forcibly fix and change things on the canvas. It really seemed to me like this was an ego thing. Like you're not gonna walk out of this classroom and shine back poorly on me. Like, no, sir, I'm going to make sure that your paintings are good enough, that you reflect well upon me. This was kind of horrifying to me, who was still very insecure about my artwork when I was 18, 19, and 20. And so this is just a representation of the fact that yes, there are good things about having mentors and teachers for a class, but sometimes it can go really, really off the rails. And the last instructor that I wanna mention for just a moment was a, uh, a painting instructor that I had that was a lovely old man. And he was just kind of super chill. He'd gone the other way. He'd gotten to the end of his career and was just totally fine with most things. Like if you put purple in a painting, you got a better grade. He told me this on my first painting. Uh, he actually asked if somebody had told me to do that. And I was like, no, I just really like the color violet. And you told us we couldn't use black. So I put a lot of purple in my painting. And he said, well, I have to give you a better grade because it has, you know, violet in it, which I thought was super strange. I wasn't unhappy with the better grade, but it was very, very odd. And then I, I had a student in that class that felt like, wasn't my student obviously, but it was a, a companion to me, a fellow student, who decided one of the projects was just too simple. We had to go paint a whole bunch of pipes in a utility room. And so he turned it into this robot just because he wanted to. And he thought that was cooler. And the teacher was not happy and gave him a lower grade, but the student was like, hey, this is what I wanted to do and your paintings are boring. So that's the thing is sometimes you're just gonna, you're not gonna jive exactly with how the teacher functions and it might not be the perfect teacher for you, but if you're going to school, you likely don't have a lot of choices. So that's some of the deficits of classes. And uh, in general, I went to art school. I had a lovely experience with art classes in high school and middle school. Actually, I didn't have any in middle school except for this one person that would randomly come, but I enjoyed it. I drew all the time. It was like every class was art class. But I had a good experience in art college. I had a good experience in art in, a, in high school. I've had a good, good experience doing online classes, but it's not for everyone and it is very expensive. It is probably the most expensive component that we'll talk about on here. If you can find a way to find instructors that you really like, that you, you think really teach the things that you want to know and you can track them down and you can afford it, wonderful. But there are certainly benefits and deficits to art classes in general. All right, the next category on here is books. Books have become far more accessible and frankly, the quality of them has increased tremendously in the past few decades. In fact, books were one of the things that you had to go to when I was growing up. And from what I've heard from people like Adam Duff, it's what he had to go to when he was growing up as well. If you didn't have access to good art teachers in your local vicinity, one of the only options you had was to find books or find somebody in your local life that could walk you through things. My father helped me with some drawing when I was little, but really I just, I copied things out of books a lot of the time. It's now easier than ever to find a good how to draw book on Amazon or your local bookstore for 20 or $30 that will give you a massive quantity of information. We also have access to a lot of different kinds of books that can help you artistically. So there's a lot of how-to books, how to draw architecture, how to draw manga, how to draw anime, how to draw anatomy, which is great. So you can look into books that are specifically geared towards whatever it is that you want to work on. But you also have art books. I love collecting these because these are just fun. These are the art of Trent Kaniga, the art of Blizzard, the art of Mark Brené. I actually just had one delivered today from an artist that I found on Instagram. I fell in love with their work and ordered their art book. It was a little bit scary because I had to order it from France. I couldn't read half of the things that I was that I was going through as I was ordering it, but it showed up today and it's lovely. I love having books that are just hundreds of pages of art of a particular thing or art of a particular artist. Now, there is kind of a separation between the art of a person and the art of a game, right? So I have art books for Zelda and for Monster Hunter and World of Warcraft, things like that. Those are helpful in a different regard. They are just the massive quantities of information and reference material. I wanna know how to do a dragon. Well, I've got tons of dragons in all these books, especially like the Magic the Gathering art books. Um, so those are kind of two categories, right? You have the artist specific, you have the like art thing, right? The, the movie, the video game. But you also have reference books. Like you could find a book that is just hundreds of pages of reptiles or hundreds of pages of anatomy photos. 
So we just have access to so many things in book form now. Well, what are the methodologies that are used in those books usually, specifically the ones that are working to teach us something specific? Well, usually books on how to learn art are geared for a particular subclass of artists based on skill. It's easy to find a book that will be geared specifically for beginners or focuses on a specific skill like anatomy, like architecture or perspective or drawing from the imagination. The books often have lots of illustrations, descriptions of what to do, and the good ones will have step-by-step -step instructions for how to achieve whatever goal the chapter is built for. In general, a good drawing book will have less than half of its pages taken up with text. Most of the space will be dedicated to illustrations and demonstrations, attempting to make up for the fact that there's no teacher in front of you to show you how to actually do the thing. What about benefits of books? First, they're cheap. I mean, they're not always cheap, right? You could spend $100 on an art book, but when it comes to comparing classes to a book, books are almost always far more cheap and far more accessible. If you live somewhere where Amazon can deliver, you can get access to almost any art book in the world. I know this isn't most people perhaps on the planet, but they're very, very accessible in general. They contain tons of information. You can have a 300 page art book that you purchased for maybe $25 that will give you enough material that if you really dive into it might occupy you for a year. If you think about the amount of material that's covered in a class because most of your time is spent practicing or listening to the instructor, it might only be 15 or 20 pages over the course of an eight week session. So if you get a book that is 300 pages long teaching you how to draw complicated things, if you really dedicated yourself to that, that book might occupy you for a year or more. There's the specificity as well that I think is really beneficial. You can find exactly what you're looking for when you get an art book. When you go to a class, there's a good chance that a portion of what is taught there is not gonna be beneficial to you and your exact specific artistic journey. There is something to be said for learning things that are ancillary to what you want, but we don't all have all the time in the world and sometimes you really wanna hone in on a particular thing and a book allows you to do that. The last benefit that I wanna to touch on here is that it allows you to work at your own pace. If you are in a class, whether it's in person or online, you generally don't have the ability to work exactly at your own pace. This does change a little bit when you pay for a class and you download it and you can just go through it and maybe go through it many, many, many times. That's a really good thing too. Although I think a lot of people, myself included, struggle with motivation working through those sometimes. So those are some of the benefits. Let's move into deficits of books. It's really easy to find beginner and advanced how to draw books, but it seems to be quite difficult to find books that are built for the space in between. And that's most of us. Finding a book that will teach you the basics of how to draw a face, easy. Finding a book that will teach you how to like show the subsurface scattering on a face in portraiture, pretty easy to find. But trying to find a book that will give you something to work through like year two to year five of becoming proficient at painting and drawing portraits is a little bit more difficult to do. I don't know why this is, but it's probably just that those are the markets, right? If you're writing a book, beginners are a huge portion of the market. And then the people that are really dedicated and really pushing to learn to be more proficient, they might not make up a huge chunk of the market, but my guess would be is they make up a large chunk of the market share. They're a large chunk of the people who are actually purchasing things. So it's kind of hard to find books after you get past the beginner stage. There's an overwhelming number of books to choose from. It can be really hard. And if you only have a couple bucks to spend on an art book, then it's difficult to choose and difficult to know that you are choosing the right one. There's too much knowledge in the books for beginners. It can be very, very overwhelming. No person is attached to the books, obviously. So it's difficult to ask questions and there's no personal connection. One of the best things about classes and about having an artistic community is that people can often point out things in your art way faster than you will realize it. I still have friends that I communicate with artistically where I'll just send a sketch and go, this hand isn't working, what's wrong? If I have to sit down and figure out how to make that hand look correct, I can do it, but often it takes me an hour or so and sometimes it's taking a photograph of my own hand in that particular pose, which if I'm the only one home, sometimes that's more difficult to do, but I can text a friend who can often sit there and be like, oh, like your, your thumb is too far down, it needs to be moved here. And they can sketch something and send a picture back to me on Discord or just through text. <laughs> So having a person attached is a really good thing and obviously that doesn't exist with a book. It's easy to fall into the trap of collecting books as opposed to actually learning from them. I have succumbed to this and I'm actually going to start moving through books 
and really trying to put together some material on like, this is how to use an art book. And then this is also like my journey through this art book and please go buy it because it's really great. Probably won't do anything for books that I don't like very much because that seems stupid. Why would I waste my time ranting about something I don't like when there's so many good things out there that I could give good feedback on? Like, go buy this book, support this artist and this author. Their stuff is great. I have certainly fallen into this trap over the years where I have collected way more art books than I've ever gone through with any sincerity. I probably have 40 or 50 art books strewn across my house. Most of them now are like in a singular location, but uh, I've also been doing this a long time, so I accumulate things over time. There's probably out of that batch of books, only maybe three to five that I've gone through halfway. Because it takes a lot of dedication, it takes a lot of time to sit down and just page by page go through an art book. And most of the ones that I have gone through have actually been for the purpose of teaching. So they've been beginner-based uh, drawing books, teaching me how to teach other people how to do it better. So it can be really easy to fall into this trap. It's one of the deficits of books, but it might be more of a me deficit than a categoric deficit of the process in general. So what are your favorite art books? I would love to know in the comments below. I'm going to do a video here pretty soon on a couple of my favorites and also going over kind of the different types of art books, like I mentioned at the beginning of this section. So let's go ahead and move on to the next area, which is actually where we find ourselves today. Videos. Welcome, I see you there. What a wonderful world that we live in, where we have access to videos of artists and art instructors walking us through how to do things that we want to do. It really is incredible. This simply did not exist when I was growing up. I could watch Bob Ross, or if I was lucky, I might be able to rent or mail order a VHS that would walk me through how to do a couple things. But to be fair, when I was growing up, there was no internet in schools, or even most homes. It's hard maybe to think about the world prior to the internet. The world prior to YouTube is uh, probably a little bit easier for most people to wrap their heads around. When I was growing up, I had access to the internet probably at about age six, which would be 30 years ago. And I had access to it earlier than most people because my dad was a nerd and dad wanted to play Mech Warrior 1 online with his uh, Air Force buddies. So I had access to it before most of my friends. When we moved to Colorado, I was 10 years old. We got internet in our home then. And even then I was one of the only people in my social circles who had access to it. We didn't have internet in the schools until I hit high school at 14, which is kind of crazy to think about. The simple fact that something like YouTube exists now means that you have access to an unfathomably large amount of potential instructional material. We are drowning in potential educational content floating around in the ether. Now, there are lots of videos about art, and a much smaller section of that array is focused specifically on teaching art. I am going to focus on that subset, the videos here on YouTube or other platforms like this that are specifically built for teaching how to make art. Well, what are the methodologies used then? Generally, art videos will be focused on one particular thing, teaching you how to draw anatomy, how to draw a sphere, or how to make straight lines. We've all seen these, right? I think even I've made tiny little sections of videos that have been like this, and many of them are really, really good. Not mine necessarily, but a lot of the other ones, there are many, many good ones on the internet. I marvel at how spoiled we are for information. If I don't know how to slowly decrease the volume at the end of a clip on my video, I can just go ahead and look that up. If I need to replace a battery in my car, I can find a video. It's amazing what you can find videos for, and it's wonderful. The benefits here are the sheer quantity of information. You have access to so many things. If you're really judicious, you can find how to do exactly what you want to do artistically. This is really, really advantageous if you work with a particular technique or in a particular program. If you are a digital artist, this is so wonderful. You can look up exactly how to manufacture your layers, how to handle masking, how to edit specific things, to add blur effects, to make motion capture things, to have animations, like the, the sheer quantity of things that you can look up that you can do in Photoshop or Krita or whatever program you're using is staggering. I think really most of us that do any form of digital art probably only harness about 10% of what that program can do. Now probably only need to use 20 or 30 percent to really function in the way that we want to but the quantity of things that you can do in adobe products is insane there's just so much there it's wonderful and you can find it all right here on youtube another benefit is the specificity 
How often do you search for something on YouTube and you cannot find anything on that topic? It's rare. It does happen, but it's really, really rare. Even if you want to figure out how to draw one specific anime character, chances are there's going to be a video somewhere teaching you how to do that. And it's just a lovely thing. Maybe the best benefit here is that it's free. YouTube is free for you to utilize. It only costs you however long the ads are on the front of the videos, and they're not even on every single video. This is so cool. The fact that you can get access to all this content for nothing, for maybe the little inconvenience of your 15 second ads. It's, ah, I, I, I struggle to describe to people who grew up without the internet how staggering this benefit is and how wonderful it is. I utilize it all the time. And I've only had YouTube Premium like for one month ever. And that was because we wanted to download things for a plane flight. The last benefit I want to hit on here, though there are many more, is that it's quick and it's easy to access. Most of us can pull up videos on our phones, which most of us have, on tablets, on computers. It's, again, just staggering the quantity of places that you can utilize this content. And it's usually pretty quick. It doesn't take a long time for most videos to prime, you know, unless you're having to download a lot of things or you have really, really slow internet. And even if you do have really slow internet, it's still there and it's still free and the access is still easy. So it's just, it's mind blowing how many benefits there are to the video content we have. But let's move into the deficits because there are some. The first deficit that I wanna hit on is actually the first benefit that I hit on, the sheer quantity of information. It is quite easy to be overwhelmed, get lost or find poor quality instruction. Because there's no oversight for the things that come onto YouTube, anyone could load it up. It's just so easy to be overwhelmed by the quantity of information. And I, I think most of us have also run into this. When you're searching for how to do something, you don't exactly know how to type it in, or maybe it's kind of convoluted, and there's so many videos and so many resources that you just don't know what to do. Maybe you watch two or three videos back to back and they say contradictory things and it gets overwhelming. It's that, that is a difficult thing. It's one of the benefits of having a mentor or a teacher that nothing else is ever going to hit. It's just, you're, you're not gonna get there. You're not gonna have somebody to walk you through those things unless you have a person to walk you through those things. Another deficit is that a good artist does not always make a good teacher. There are loads of wonderful, fantastic artists here on this platform, many of whom you can go watch work and you can see the undeniable skill that they possess. But just because somebody has the ability to do something does not mean that they're good at teaching it. I talked about this earlier when it came to classrooms and to working from teachers. And this is just, we all know this. Anyone who's ever had a teacher before has had a bad teacher, unless you've only had like one teacher and it was good. Then, wow, that's, I leave that in the comments below because that's bizarre and confusing. Uh, <laughs> but people who are good at a thing are not always good at teaching the thing. It's just undeniable. It's, yes, they have the ability, they can demonstrate how to do it, but it doesn't mean that they necessarily know how you need to do it, how other humans need to do it. Maybe they're a little strange, maybe they're just like everyone else, but you don't know. And so there's a lot of people on YouTube that teach how to make art that maybe aren't good teachers. Now, granted, there are some really, really good ones, and I can leave some in the comments down, or not in the comments, but in the description down below. Um, I think that Mark Brené is quite a good teacher. I think that Trent Kaniga is quite a good teacher. And um, Alfonso Dunn is quite a good teacher if you're looking for just straight up pen and ink techniques. There's a lot on here. Those are just the ones that are coming to me right now. I might leave some other, oh, Marco Bucci. Can't forget Marco Bucci, he's great too. There are a ton on this platform, it's undeniable. But there are also a lot of people who are just quite good at art, quite good at painting or whatever it is that they do and they're not necessarily good teachers. And it's sometimes hard when you're learning, when you're a student, to pull those things apart and understand. If you get a little bit older, if you stay with the medium a little bit longer, you will inevitably get to a point where you're able to sit there and go, maybe this person is a good teacher, but they're not a good teacher for me. That's hard to do when you're starting though, and it's hard to do when you're overwhelmed by 10,000 videos on the particular topic. Another deficit, videos are often a single lesson and it can be quite difficult to find a follow-up that works on the next specific skill or technique that you need. You may find some great channels on here that are providing follow-ups or playlists geared specifically towards those things, but it's not ubiquitous. It doesn't occur all the time. 
And the last is just simply that there's no personal connection most of the time. When you're working with, uh, working from videos on this platform or another, there is not necessarily a connection between you and the artist. Sure, you can leave comments, but if you're watching a video that has a million views, the chances of your comment being read, let alone responded to, is... Oh my goodness, it's it's hard to, to think of the statistics when it comes to something like that. So, uh, it's undeniable though, videos are wonderful. I'm obviously making them right now, and I think that it is probably the way of the future when it comes to education in a lot of aspects, especially after teaching through the pandemic and doing a lot of my education via the internet slash videos. It's opened my eyes to a lot of things. It's certainly not perfect, but there is probably... This is probably the way of education in the future. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to the last of these four categories for today. Practice and time. This is fairly straightforward, right? Putting your nose to the grindstone and simply practicing the thing that you want to improve at. In a lot of ways, this might be the original way to learn. Before videos or books were widespread or even created, if you wanted to get good at something, you did it again and again. And this works. That's the great thing, is that banging your head against the wall long enough can actually get you decent results. It's kind of crazy. I know that we have all run into people in our lives who say things like, Oh, I wish I could draw like that. You are so talented. I am screaming on the inside when people say this. No, you don't. If you wanted to be able to do this, you would have put in the time. You would have sacrificed to learn the skill. You want the skill with no strings attached, with no commitment. Perhaps this is why AI art is so tantalizing to people. At first glance, it gives any person the ability to make art. I've even heard people use the loathsome phrase, it democratizes art. Brother or sister, it's always been democratized. Just put in the time. <laughs> what are the methodologies used then? This seems, again, pretty straightforward. Practice by itself accomplishes little. We have heard the phrase practice makes perfect and it is simply not true. A more accurate phrase might be practice makes better or practice specifically improves the individual skill you're practicing, but that doesn't sound as pretty, does it? So we repeat, practice makes perfect, when really practice makes proficient. Practicing specific things will improve those skills though. If you want to make a comic, practicing anatomy, posing, dynamic compositions, and graphic design will almost inevitably improve your skills in those areas. How well you practice, how much time you practice, and your personal inclinations will decide how quickly improvement comes, but it will come, rest assured. This took me a long time to wrap my head around, the fact that there is no secret, that it's just about doing it enough and learning how you personally learn. In fact, that is kind of the whole point of this entire episode. You need to know how you learn. You need to learn how you learn. What are the benefits of just investing practice and time? Slow, but almost assured progress. It's often easy to find direction. You usually know what your needs are, what your desires are, and you know where to put your time. Because you are working on singular skills, it's easier to look up other resources like mentors, videos, and books. The benefits are pretty straightforward, just like the methodology. But the deficits are kind of similar. It's slow, and it's lonely. It's not romantic and it's not glorious. It works, but it's not very fancy. If you tell your family that you're going to art school, you're gonna have a lot of people that just go, oh good, you're making progress in a culturally approved way. If you tell your family that, oh, I'm working at Starbucks and I practice art a lot at home, they might have a different response. Practicing, after all, is not glorious. It's so mundane and normal that it's kind of looked down upon and it's often forgotten as the tried and true and perhaps oldest method of learning anything that humans came up with. Well, I think there's a way we can proceed from here. To wrap this up, let's take a look at an example. How do I learn? I can't tell you how you learn specifically. I would love to. I would love to have the opportunity to work with you as an individual and try to discover that with you. But I can tell you how I learn. This has taken me a long time to unpack and I'm not sure that I'm done yet. I've spent years practicing specific things, looking through books, hoping for some secret sauce that will help me learn the special key to unlock my skill. And I've taken more classes than I could reasonably count without utilizing a spreadsheet. But oh, I love spreadsheets. What I have found is that I improve most when I focus on a particular skill, 
practice it for a time, and then immediately implement it into a project. Just copying birds does little to help me draw birds, but if I work from references to make a painting or a digital character design, those references stick in my mind, and I can then implement a percentage of what I learned into the next piece. So often I will work to paint an owl or a condor or something like that. I will use reference material for that. And spending the four or five hours that it takes to complete that painting, I learn things about how the eye functions, where it's positioned, how the feathers connect to the body structure. And then I'll practice right after that, drawing from memory those kinds of things, slowly manipulating them and changing them and usually turning them into dinosaurs because I turn most things into dinosaurs except for people. The reality is it's not glorious, but working from reference on projects then allows me to retain some of what I've learned and to implement it into the next thing. I have found that every day I take away from my art, I lose a percentage of my ability to see correctly. Now, see is the correct word here. It's not I lose some of my art ability. My fine motor skills and my ability to break things down decays very slowly. But my ability to see the connections in things, to see them in my mind and to see them on the page as I put them together, deteriorates quite quickly. I lose some small quality of my skill with each day that I take a break. It seems very small at first, like half a tenth of a percent or something like that, but it seems to increase exponentially. If I take a few days off, usually I'm fine. If I take a month off of oil painting, it's a grind to get back in and I hate it. So I have to keep making things regularly and focus on specific skills tied into projects to continue honing my skills. I try to draw or paint every single day. I don't quite do it, but out of the 30 to 31 days in a month, I probably hit 27. I figure that's probably okay. It's maybe an average of a half day to one day off a week. It's almost always by accident but I try to draw every day and I just give myself a break when I don't quite hit it. This strategy is not glorious. It's not fancy. It's really just work. And maybe that is why art is hard. At the end of the day, it's work. It is beautiful, glorious, honorable, but it is work. It is good and it is worth doing, but it is hard. Well, what was the point of all of this then? There is no secret. Learning art is hard, sure, but it's mostly just weird. You can find many gurus who will tell you that they definitively know how you learn or how to teach, and maybe they're right, but I don't think so. They are more likely correct about some portion of the population, maybe even a large portion, but artists learn differently, and the best I can hope to do here is hit upon as many potentials as possible in the time we have together. So I hope there is something here that benefited you, some encouragement or some random knowledge imparted. So what about you? How do you learn? What periods of your artistic journey have carried the most growth? Please let me know in the comments below, not just for my benefit or the algorithms, but for all the other people who are listening and who might read those comments, who can be encouraged by what you have to share. Thank you all for listening, for adding your own thoughts, and for being a part of this. I really appreciate it. Have a good one, y'all. See you soon.